Hello, good afternoon everyone and a warm welcome to all of you for joining this webinar, Making Risk Management Work for Programmes, which is organised by the APM Programme Management Specific Interest Group. I'm Nigel Beecroft, um, I'm co-chair of the Programme Management uh, SIG. So now I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers today. Firstly, Dr. Ruth Murray Webster, who is a recognised leader of organisational change performing a number of roles over a 30-year career, including practitioner, researcher, and author. She was lead editor of the latest version of Managing Successful Programmes and is an honorary fellow of the APM. Secondly, Dr. Penny Pullen, who's an experienced program manager, providing expertise through her consultancy, Making Projects Work. Life like Ruth, Penny has authored a number of books and articles within a field, uh, specialising in the areas of collaboration and virtual leadership. Together, Ruth and Penny have recently had a new book published, uh, which is entitled Making Risk Management Work, Engaging People to Identify, Own and Manage Risk, which is the subject of today's webinar, uh, with a strong programme management bias, of course. So welcome, Ruth and Penny. Super. So let's go straight over to Ruth. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, so thank you, Nigel, for that introduction. Um, I'll just say um, just a few more words, really, that um, my company, um, Potentiality UK, uh, is really um, just a vehicle for my fascination of how, um, for how you know, organisations um, of, of all types in public and private and charitable sectors can actually leverage value um, from uncertainty and change. There's there's so much around that um, uncertainty and, and risk are bad and change is bad. And um, I'm sure all, everyone on this call is not in that mindset. Um, so, yeah, um, and what I find is that increasingly um, clients um, want help to help them make risk management work and particularly for uh, large projects and programs so I'll be sharing some of that experience this morning it's lovely to be with you and i'm penny pullen and um i worked with ruth 11 yeah more than 11 yeah 11 years ago for our first book on this um, and this is the second edition so it's been lovely and we've added in things that we've noticed are becoming more and more important, not completely new things, but things that really have a raised profile. So things around bias and how that gets in the way of risk management or can get in the way. And also um, obviously nowadays with virtual and hybrid um, risk, how do you work with risk in that sort of environment? And those are the, that, that latter aspect is one that I work with most of the time in my other books as well. But over to you, Ruth, to talk a little bit about this new book. Yeah, so I think, um, as Penny said, this is um, this is a second edition. Um, the the first edition was was had a different title actually, which probably is a bit confusing, but um, was was really about a short guide to facilitating risk management. But it's still that that sort of subtitle of engaging people to identify own and manage risk and that and that is you know still our passion here how do we move beyond um a risk process lens and get into having much better conversations um about risk and so people can do the right things and i think you know in reflecting um for today you know programs are particularly uncertain and it's particularly the case that risk process isn't enough to make risk management work in programs. And so, um, but also, you know, Penny was saying that we often, the, the two new chapters we have in this book, you know, one about um, people and their perceptions and, and why they matter and picking up bias, and also thinking about virtual and hybrid working. They are both areas that could be seen as sort of negative or potentially problematic you know oh, bias is a problem or working virtually is a problem but i think what we hope to do today is just flip that a little and say well how can you get benefit from your programs from really harnessing um you know 
um, how how people perceive things and how we work in different ways um, to create to create more value. So I think that's what we plan to do, Penny. Hey, that's right. Yes. So a slightly more detailed plan. We're going to use um, my magic six, which are the six key questions to start off any session, and this works beautifully virtually. So let's just run through this very quickly. So what are we here to do? What's the purpose of today? So we're here to explore some aspects of making risk management work. And I add for programs, um, although of, obviously this will work for all sorts of other types of change that you're involved in, but we're specifically interested in answering your questions around program, risk on programs. So we're going to do, what are we going to do? The sort of four or five objectives, we're going to have a bit of an intro, which this is part of. We're going to look at some of the pitfalls with risk management and look at what's really happening now. So perhaps take this moment to start thinking, what are my big questions about risk for programs? And then we can have those coming in. And also what's happening in your program environment that it would be helpful for us to consider? We'll think a little bit about those, and then we have these two new new chunks, how bias helps and hinders, and making virtual, remote, and hybrid risk management work. What's our time plan? Well, our time plan was to start at 12.30, which we did. Um, any final questions, we should be able to finish off around um, 20 past one, and we should close um, at the end of the hour. Who's doing what? Always useful to have clear. So Penny and Ruth are speaking. Um, I'm Penny and I'm doing the scribbling on the slide. Timekeeper, I think that's Nigel, isn't it? Yes. Thank you. Certainly. We talked about that earlier. And please, everyone, please consider yourself to be a participant. Um, we'd really like to have your input. Right, I'm gonna hand over to Ruth for a moment. Okay, so um, one of the things that we, um, we did in the first edition of the book and we've we've built on it in in this next was was really try to um pull together all the things that people were telling us um in our professional practice around the pitfalls associated with making risk management work um loads and loads of them we gathered them um you know we started in the first edition like 11 years ago and we've continued just gathering yeah yeah but the problem where i work is this or you know what yeah but what about this you know it'd be okay if only um and we we noticed that the pitfalls really um fell into three main chunks lots of pitfalls around the risk management process um, you know, hopefully um, your uh, risk registers don't have um, cobwebs on them. Um, uh, none of them are on, on paper, of course, nowadays, but lots about process making, process work, around the data associated with the process. Um, but also another chunk of pitfalls that were really around facilitation, about how easy it was to um, put the process into practice, how easy it was to work with groups of people to identify risks or to prioritise risks or to come up with useful responses and implement those and monitor that over time. Mm -hmm. So um, lots of pitfalls to do with facilitation. And then thirdly, um, and um, maybe not quite so much, um, but some big questions around around culture, about attitudes to risk management, whether it was safe to um, raise your perception of uh, what's risky and why in your organisation, were there things at play that were closing down that conversation, or indeed, you know, was uh, you know, did the culture reward? Um, good risk management or, or is the culture really more about rewarding heroes so just a few things there lots and lots of them in the book but we thought that it might be useful um, today to you know use that just as a little bit of a trigger and um, then for you to tell us you know what what's happening for you out there with risk in your programs um, you know either statements or questions we'd really love to hear so now what's really, really happening out there with risk on your programs so tell us about that now and um and then where at 
all possible we will pick those up as we go through the rest of of this webinar so we'll just uh, pause pause for a minute or so while you can um type in your comments or questions to the question box lots of comments coming in some good afternoons tom's saying key risk is always resources and resource management Tams is talking about lack of senior attention to high risks they're recorded but not taken seriously got in, inconsistent application of the strategy or process from phil some people see risk discussions as as blame says sarah um risk is a i think pe people think risk is a really boring subject and then don't engage um it's often never really broken down into easy to understand chunks we have a regular regular monthly risk reporting mechanism says tino risk identification is hit and miss says ashok much larger focus on financial impacts of risk says craig risks are highlighted but i don't think they're given due regard or dismissed <laughs> the sharon is sometimes seen as devil's advocate in this there's confusion about longer term strategic risks and the day to day program management risks, says Elaine. So, confusion between those. Different behaviors across different teams, says David. The environment, says Nicole. People are good at raising risks, but less so at identifying a response, says Chris. Is risks are identified, but it's hard to get stakeholders to define them correctly, even when directing them to good practice. It's even harder to get them to be monitored on a regular basis, um, especially the risk owners. Um, too many raid logs in one program. There's Gerhardt. Business development in pharma. This is Nick, naturally risk adverse. How do, change, how do we change behavior? Lots coming through, not enough people. Projects office, says Claire. Biggest challenge is getting some project managers to centrally report risks. Lack of defined strategy, says Eleanor. Not an active process, says Phil. It's more like dusting off the risk file, a bit like our picture. Jane, build up commitment in the organization to think about risk and populate the risk register. But then what gets forgotten? Low knowledge and capability, says Daniel. Sometimes I feel like risks are logged but often ignored, says Yvonne. In my organization, says Dean, we develop detailed risk registers. How we just guess what the potential impact will be in terms of costs? We've got huge numbers of questions. Um, I don't think we can carry on reading them out. Um, I think perhaps this is something we'll have, to, we'll have to digest as we go through. Ruth, have you got a feel for those that have come up so far? Yeah, I mean, just. Um what I would say is that uh, just reflecting on that, you know, partly it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> but how, um, I think there's something interesting that, um, you know, the, the, the sort of theory, if you like, of, of risk management, you know, of, of um, you know, that we, we understand the objectives at risk, you know, we understand how much risk is tolerable and then we identify risks and we prioritize them and respond to them. That process has been around forever, you know, well, not forever, but for a long time. This is not new. Mm -hmm. Yet organizations clearly from, you know, the evidence of your comments and questions really struggle to get it right. And um, it, I, I, I do find it endlessly um, fascinating why, why that's the case. But I think that, you know, in in all of your questions, there, there's there's definitely a, a a people thing, isn't there? Running running through that, you know, whether it's um, lot so many of your questions that say to me in your organisation, this is not seen as important. Something else is seen as important. Risk management is mm -hmm. not seen as being central or core to to being successful with your investments in programmes. Um, the you know, and another layer deeper then is well, um, you know, there's some jeopardy here in terms of speaking up. If it feels like blame, if it feels like senior leaders are not really that interested, there's some personal jeopardy in in actually, you know, needing to do this. So if no one's bothered in the first place, and then it's unsafe to do it well, well, so that's a double whammy, you know. It's um, so and and then you know just just the boring thing 
um, yeah, it can be really boring, but it doesn't have to be boring. And I think that's really at the heart of, of Penny and I's passion, um, you know, in, in writing this book and, and the work we do is just to try and make it, I might say, a little bit simpler and, you know, a little bit, it, it ne probably never fun. But, but something that is a little bit more interesting. Um, so many of those comments are dealt with in that pitfalls chapter and um, we didn't know what you were gonna say and we, I don't want it to be one of those terrible webinars that just says, oh, dial into our webinar and we'll tell you that all the answers are in the book. But some, but some of them are. Uh, yeah. Some of them are and, um, and de you know, definitely we can, we can um, just try and pick up those themes as um, as we go forward um, with some of the other things we want to explain to you. Um, it's fascinating, yeah. isn't it, Ruth? How some of these these um, questions echo down the years. So risks and issues being confused. Um, you know, stakeholders rolling their eyes when it comes to risk. Um, people putting you know just the tick box exercises. Whoa. Yeah, well, I, and I was just going to say, you know, that sometimes at the heart of all those those questions is a misunderstanding of why we're bothering in the first place. And I mm. think that may be, um, you know, a good place to uh, to sort of move on and to think about the section we've got in here that, well, in the presentation, we've called it biases and the brain. But in the book, it's, um, the chapter is about people and their perceptions and why why that matters yeah why people and their perceptions matter when trying to make risk management work let's let's just start with some thoughts about well why we bother anyway you know and i know that there's like if you look in um you know the the apms and um, pram guide for example or in you know um, other other similar publications the benefits of risk management you know there are loads of them both you know hard and soft benefits of risk management but for me why we bother is um really summed up on the next on the next slide um and this is um something that um we've got david hilson listening into this is a theme that has been picked up in some of my work with david too Really, you know, we're only bothering with risk management because we we want our decisions to be good decisions, you know. Um, but what is a good decision? And the little grid on the on the screen now, you know, is suggesting and and hopefully uh, is is sort of obvious when you look at it that the outcome of our work, so the outcome of your program whether it's a good outcome and the benefits have been all realized or none of the benefits have been realized or indeed somewhere in the middle but the you know the the degree to which the outcome is as desired is um is not controllable at at the at the start the decisions that you make um need to be about you know good decisions can't be judged on the outcomes they can only be judged on the reasoning because you might have a good outcome to your program and you have just been really lucky you didn't you know you didn't pay attention to really any of the uncertain factors in the environment you know you didn't do risk management well you know there's a lot of winging it going on you had a few strokes of luck and um, oh aren't we marvelous um, you know, or you might have a bad outcome because you did all sorts of good work, but yet there were things out with your control, you know, that you were just unlucky. You can't control everything. Um, and so luck, you know, comes into it, whether, whether we like it or not. And what we're trying to do is to get to a position where we've got good reasoning when we make decisions, which will then um, lead us more of the time to good outcomes. For me, that's the only reason why we do risk management, to help us. So our right reasoning is not only thinking about what we know, the facts, but is also thinking about what we don't know. 
um, the risks. And just thinking about, you know, your programs, um, you know, if you're working within a um, a linear or sequential life cycle or a, or a hybrid life cycle with sequential decision gates as happens in government and many large corporates in early life cycle what we're trying to do is understand as much about the investment as possible including you know the uncertainty and risk and through analysis and iteration and prototyping we're trying to understand enough so we can make realistic promises to investors we're trying to make good decisions and risk management is an integral part of that then after a final investment decision what we're largely trying to do is protect that value so to do what we've promised but still keeping an eye on what's coming down the track you know to disruption to emergence and obviously in a programmatic life cycle every chance you are looking again at what's changed in the macro context that that matters to to what you're trying to do so for me yeah it's about making good decisions protecting previous um previous decisions and so how do if we're going to focus on right reasoning well what is that and you know we would argue that it requires us to understand something of how the human brain works so if we just look at the next picture penny um a really simple picture clearly we're a bit more complex you know in here than um, than than the picture shows but there is an enormous amount of evidence <clears throat> out there um that when faced with a risky and important decision we all like to think we're rational and objective that we're engaging you know that frontal lobe our gray matter and that we we are we are rational actors but in truth we're influenced more than we probably like to think we are by either instincts and um, particularly the case if we feel in, in danger or under threat, but something that's that's an instinct, or by emotions, or particularly emotionally charged memories, or both. So a massive amount of evidence out there that this is the case, and so it's something that I've been really interested in for some time now. And if we look at the next slide, this is um a simple um, drawing, a depiction of work that David Hilston and I first published, well actually in 2005, um, adapted in 2007. We were really um, uh, interested in the mid noughties in, in understanding and managing attitudes to risk and there's been an explosion of information about biases and how they skew the perception and um, since then so i'm sure this is not a new topic to you but what i'd like to do is just use an example of each of those strands applicable to risk management in programs today to perhaps trigger some thinking so you know when we're faced with a risky and important decision there is um there's there's a, a strand that is about conscious thought where we are engaging that rational part of the brain and we're saying have i seen this before um clearly historic data available data is really important but you know how how to what degree should we trust this and rely on it you know how reliable is past da data in a in a vuca world or some might say, um, you know, a, a, a Bani world or a Bainy world. Um, I only heard of this few few months ago, but with a client who, rather than VUCA, was saying that their context was B A N I, brittle, anxious, non-linear, and incomprehensible. So whether that feels like your world or not, you know, in that sort of world, single point estimates are not that useful. Um, being certain, you know, um, is based on historic data is not that useful. And so, you know, knowing that we are biased by um, by just conscious factors, uh, conscious situational factors is, is really important. Um, I mean, just an example, I'm currently working with a, a government department helping them to stress test the plans that they have for a risky endeavor and to see how well those plans stand up 
if you like, in the wind tunnel of, of external change. And in doing that, using available data is really important, but with a large dose of, of healthy scepticism too. So we're asking all the time, what's new in this situation? And are we being biased by thinking we can manage this one just like the last one? Hopefully you won't fall into that trap. So that's the conscious strand that affects our perception of risk and then our choices and behaviours. The middle one, subconscious factors. So much has been written about this and I could talk forever and I won't. But some of you will have heard of heuristics and of cognitive biases. So just a couple of examples. Um, we know that people, all people, are biased um, by looking for evidence that matches their previous decisions, what we call the confirmation trap. That we're, we, and we do this because we, you know, we, as, as um, our brains, you know, they want to find patterns and we want to be efficient in our decision making. So we're looking for evidence that matches, that matches, that matches, that matches. Um, that can be really dangerous when we're very committed to objectives you know so for example in your program if the only data that gets through is the data that supports your previous decision then you're probably going to miss lots and lots of stuff so how do we keep minds open to consider that we might not be correct and it's really tricky um, in projects and programs where we are deciding what to do in early life cycle and then holding on tightly to that. And I think programs are more conditional by nature. We're testing a hypothesis rather than executing the plan. But nevertheless, we all fall foul of confirmation trap from time to time, I think. So that's a heuristic, a, sh a mental shortcut to help us be efficient. Um, cognitive biases, um, always bad, um, dr drag us away from really seeing things as they are. Some of you will have heard, the example I'm gonna use is the sunk cost fallacy. Um, there are so many people who I see in projects and programs who um, you know, use the, the sort of mastermind start it so I'll finish sort of thinking, oh well I've started this, so it's got to be economically rational to finish because look at all this effort and funding that we've sunk into this investment. Well, sunk is sunk. You know, you sink enough um, you sink enough money into any project or program and its MPV will be positive. You know, it's what's rational is knowing when to cut losses and move on because you can't be successful. But as human beings, we're all drawn into this, ah, uh, you know, um, well, I've spent so much on it, you know, and it's where sayings like um, that they're throwing good money after bad comes from because we're biased by the sunk, the sunk cost bias or the sunk cost fallacy. There are loads of these. A Google search will throw up hundreds and hundreds of cognitive biases. And then the third strand, and this was really core to David and I's work, um, you know, um, nearly 20 years ago now, is the affective strand. You know, how do I feel about this? So it's the emotional part. Who has stakeholders who are in love with their program? Maybe you're in love with your program, you know, may, but, but certainly, I mean, I do lots of work in government nowadays and there are lots of programs who are there because politicians are in love with that program. And that, that feeling, that emotion is absolutely blinding for seeing what's really going on and for being open to hear evidence of uncertainties and risks that might challenge that starting premise. It's a really serious point and really tricky for leaders who in, in programmes because we need to believe in what we do to be motivated to keep going day after day. Yet we also need to be objective enough when, to know when the benefits can't be realised and it's not worth continued investment. And you know, the, the things that bias our perception on that are often about emotions and, and another emotion, or is it fear? You know, is it fear that we're afraid of speaking truth to power, that we're afraid of saying that this is the wrong thing, that we're afraid of sticking our neck, you know, above the parapet and saying, you know what, you know, I'm seeing this a different way to everyone else.
So just a small number of ways in, in that little section in, in, um, that our brain might be biased by our perception of risk and preventing us making good decisions. Um, so is all lost? No, not all is lost. And there are three things that we um, that we pick up um, in the book, and th these are also explained actually in um, in David and I's last book, Making Risk and Important Decisions: A Leader's Guide. Um, these points here, there are um, Nobel Prize winning um, uh, economists who. Um, written most of these so i'm just going to point you in the direction but so important um i think for um thinking about these also in the context of virtual and hybrid working which is what we're going to do next so um uh Kahn and tversky very famously um uh and uh, tversky died before he could uh, achieve um the nobel prize for economics um uh, which is not awarded posthumously, but Daniel Kahneman did win that prize for their work largely on reframing. So very simply, that, that looking at a problem from a different angle triggers a different response. So reframing is a vital skill, in my opinion, for anybody working in projects and programmes, particularly when you get stuck on something, just putting, laying out the question or the data in a different way, looking at it from a different angle can really open up and trigger different responses. So if you do nothing else, think about how you're using framing and reframing um, in your work, it can be really useful. The second thing is about enabling conscious awareness. So some of you will have read Daniel Kahneman again's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, a, you know, a, a sort of a, an airporty type book, but based on you know years of research, um, and that you know um, linked to what I was saying about you know the subconscious um, uh, biases, cognitive biases, and heuristics. You know, we need to be able to think fast. We think fast most of the time, but sometimes problems need us to think slow. So what are the ways that you're building in slower thinking into your risk processes, enabling that conscious awareness? And the third area, um, and it's one of my favorite books ever, 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 called The Wisdom of Crowds, um, written by um, uh, an American uh, journalist, absolutely fascinating book, um, that um, really just debunks the idea that if you want to know the right answer, ask an expert. That the wisdom of crowds is saying this is not about single experts, this is about large numbers of people who could have a reasonable view being um, asked independently and the data from that is much 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 more likely to give you the right answer to thorny problems than asking a single expert. So those three things are really important for making risk management work in my experience um, and I think that there's something about virtual, uh, remote and hybrid working that we might think would make risk management harder, but done well, that some of this can be easier. So I'm going to shut up, hand over to Penny, um, who will help us with her specialist subject. Hi, thank you so much, Ruth. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Although these are two separate areas that we're looking at, how they do link in. So in the slide here on the left hand side, we've got how many of us would have done a lot of work on risk over the years in a risk workshop um, with everybody together in the same place. Um, not necessarily the best way to do it, especially given that that useful thing of countering biases, of getting independent input and the wisdom the wisdom of crowds thought, how do we get input from lots of different people to get the best? So how do we do risk workshops now? Well, I'm interested. We maybe do it with everyone virtual. Maybe you have hybrid where you have some people in a, in a room together and others joining. Perhaps you have several different offices all joining together. Um, 
in different places, or perhaps you have a combination of these. Um, lots and lots of different ways of working when we can't all be in the room. That in, in many cases that's gone now and we're doing a funny mix. The trouble with hybrid though, when you're working in workshops um, and risk workshops just as much, is that there's not a level playing field. Now I don't usually use football, but this is a very good analogy. Because if you have some people who are remote and you have some people who are in the room, then it's much easier for the people in the room to interact with each other, to pick up on the nuances and dynamics of conversation and to, to have those tricky challenges and debates and to see each other. So um, yeah, we've got a problem here and we need to do something about it. So if you are going to do things in a hybrid way, and I know a lot of people are doing a lot of work in a hybrid way, we need to um, see what we can do to make this a level playing field as opposed to a sloping playing field. So these are the remote people over here, and these are the people who are in the room. We need to do something that will bring it more level. So probably going to be raising the remote people, maybe dropping the people in the room down a little bit, if you like, but coming up with something much more level. So one thing you can do is to make sure that you always use, you always come to the remote people first. So if you're going to ask people for input, perhaps you could use this hashtag remote first and always go to the remote people first before you ask people who are in the room. Other things that you can do, you can be incredibly clear, use that magic six, those six questions that really help. And just to remind you, at the start of any session, make clear what it is you're really doing, the purpose we are here to. Today we will then go into more deeper objectives our plan, talk about the time plan, talk about who's doing what, agree how you'll work together and what the outputs will be. Build trust. I think if you're going to be able to, uh, to manage risk, you really do need to have trust in your across your program and with your stakeholders so that you can actually, um, people can raise things that others might not like to hear. And that's something to build up slowly and gradually from the beginning. Um, but remember, it can be destroyed in an instant. Um, there are lots of things you can do. One thing is really to have virtual leadership. Um, and that starts with you. So whether you're a program manager or a program office manager, a project manager, whatever, it starts with you. How can you be the best you can at working in this? What was that acronym, Ruth? Um, very interesting new A one, not VUCA. B-A-N-I, brittle, anxious, uh, non-linear and incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. In this sort of world, let, this is a virtual leadership model, um, but yes, in, in this veiny world, um, it's all about stepping up yourself. Um, so there you are in the very center. What can you do to be the best leader of your program, of your of the risk that you are working with in your program? How can you then connect with others, even though you may well be separated if you're in a hybrid hybrid team in your program? Um, how can you build rapport and trust and connection and all those things that build the culture that make it much easier to work effectively with risk and to make those good risk-based decisions for your program? If we go out another layer, yes, we need to work with technology. We need to be able to work in our meetings, whether they're virtual, hybrid, remote, and also work in between. And a lot of us are calling this asynchronous now when we're not at the same time in the same place, but we'll come back to that. And other things will affect it. 
why time zones make these things much harder. G generational differences can get in the way, language differences, and even different English, Englishes, South African English, American English, they're all slightly different, and culture is so important with all of this. So lots to think about. But this morning, Ruth and I were preparing for this, and we are thinking that this grid that is very useful when you're working with people to work out how um, how they can work together effectively as a hybrid team, that this actually is also quite useful to think about when we're working together to manage risk. Remember what Ruth said just now about how independent input is so helpful to overcome biases. So you can do thinking on your own without others um, influencing your thinking. And actually quite big chunks of the risk process are best done in this different time, different place. So not in risk workshops, whether in person or remote, but independently. So let's just write independent thinking over here. So when you're on your own and you can think on your own about it. Ruth, would you like to come in and, and talk, tell us a little bit about why you think things like risk identification really should start here and not in a big workshop? Yeah, I've, I've come to um, the point of view um, over the years that actually every step of the risk process, whether it's deciding what are the objectives at risk. I noticed there was a comment in um, that, you know, we mix up risks and the impact of risks. So, you know, we need to start is, you know, what's at risk? What are the objectives at risk? You know, how much risk are we prepared to take? Then what are the risks? How are we going to prioritise the risks based on, um, you know, likelihood and, and size of impact? What are we going to do about them? Every one of those steps, rather than thinking about, risk workshops that do all of it, I, I've come to the conclusion that every one of those steps works best when you start with the key players, the key stakeholders in that decision, thinking about it independently. That's the way. We, we'd be, we might still be biased as individuals, but we won't fall into the, any of the biases like groupthink that come from um, working together. So get independent thought, whoever's you know, coordinating, facilitating that, you know, bring that together. Um, it can be anonymous. You can see outliers. You can see that there are different points of view. And then the decision makers can come together, ideally same time, same place, either, you know, in the same room or virtually, um, to then say, right, so what for this? You know, what decision are we going to make based on this? It could be decisions about, about risks that need to be raised. It could be decisions about prioritisation of risks. It could be decisions about what to do about them. It could be decisions about contingency. Any decisions we need to make as a result of that information, then um, I would say independent thinking first, then bring it to a decision-making meeting. Um, Hybrid, I, I would say I really struggle with hybrid. I'm a, I avoid, um, so I'm lucky enough that in some of the work that I do, I just ban it. Like I say, I'm not prepared to work in that way. So we're either all virtual, you know, mm. or, or so we're all different place, same time. Um, or we, um, we are in the same place together. Um, but sometimes, you know, I'm part of I'm part of groups where, you know, that there is hybrid working going on, some in the same room and, and some not. Um, I think that when it when it comes to hybrid, then you know, your top tips are really important, Penny. But the I would flip the risk bit to say lots of value in slow thinking, time to think, independent thinking. Um, and then bring that back. And, and the point about reframing also that I made, you can, as a facilitator, set up the frame really clearly if you're doing it for people to work on independently. 
it means you can write it down you can write down assumptions you can you can make the frame really really clear um and then and then get independent thought to that and maybe depending on what's coming out of it then reframe also in different time and different place and get independent thinking and then bringing people together so um not wanting to go on too long but yeah the um the the, the work that I'm doing at the moment, I was talking, doing this piece of scenario planning with a, a large a large government department. We're all doing lots of independent thinking about, for example, macro contextual factors. Which ones do people perceive as being certain? Which ones do people perceive as being uncertain? We're doing independent thinking about who the stakeholders are. Um, so lots of input coming together which I can then process and so facilitate that when we're in the same place at the same time to actually then test the scenarios versus the plan, everybody's had their input to the parameters that frame the scenarios. I'm finding that works really well and um, yeah, so that would be my advice. Just to come in there, um, Ruth, the thing about everyone being remote or everyone being in person is there is naturally an absolutely level playing field. So if you are going to work in a hybrid way, then you have to put a massive amount of effort in to, to bring things more level. And if you don't, it's just a disaster. Mm -hmm. Right. So ideally, this is where we would be with, with program risk, with everybody um, working together, energized, interested, um, and all singing from the same hymn sheet, we could say. Yeah, that's right. And um, it, I just want to pick up on Catherine's um, comments, um, uh, which says it sounds like different time, different places, basically having time to prep before a meeting. And you know, you're dead right. That is what it is. Um, but it's preparing in a really, um, it's, pre it's preparing in a way that might be, um, take quite a lot of time, but, but that actually um, values that independent thought of, of, in, of individuals. So I think you're right, it is all it is, but um, you know, I think we've particularly with, well, with lots of things that we do, but particularly with risk, you know, we, we got into bad habits of thinking, right, now's the day for risk. Let's do a workshop. Let's all get together mm. and try and sort it out. And, and I would say it doesn't work. And it leads to all the things mm. that you were saying at the start about, you know, things getting mixed up, um, mm. it being boring, people blaming, et cetera, et cetera. But Penny, you wanted me to speak to this picture. I love this picture. Hooray, risk. Um, I guess, you know, this this picture's what it says to me is, if we're gonna make risk management work, if we're really gonna engage people to identify, own and manage risk, then there's something about working together, but not working together um, maybe in some of the ways we've done before, being creative about how we work together, how we work together in different times and different places, how we work together in the same time, same place, how we work together hybrid in a hybrid way. That we move from the idea of workshops to conversations, you know, far away from a set piece process into a, a guiding process but actually the focus is more on the, dis it's not about doing risk management to tick the box, but it's engaging with risk to help us make better decisions. And there's lots of different ways of, of doing that. But when it works well, hey, it's sweet, and people really are aligned and cheering. And, you know, and I come across so many great examples of risk thinking being done well. Often, when it's not called risk management, when it's called resilience planning, maybe, when it's called scenario planning, you know, lots and lots of people talk about pre-mortems, you know, it's a risk technique, um, you know, lots and lots of, and, and sometimes we just have to call it something else to get that sort of engagement um, that's possible. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, some, some ideas today I might trigger some different uh, some mm -hmm. more more questions or we can go back and um you know pick out some of the things that you've already said 
Super. So yes, we, we have a space for questions now. So we've had lots and lots of questions, but if there's anything particular that you've got now, um, but I will just move on to share our contact details. And we've put little QR codes so that you can connect with us in LinkedIn and have an individual conversation with us, um, with each of us very easily. So if you just point at the QR code with your phone, it should, in the photo app, it should then take you straight there. So I hope that's useful for you. And questions, what questions have come in that would be helpful to answer? Yeah, there's there's a there's a few questions, quite a lot of comments as well. Um, I mean, the interaction's been brilliant, so thank you, thank you everyone. Um, there was one that caught my eye earlier on um, around um, uh, sort of aff affection. Um, so it we got from uh, Simon, love my program year on year. Which I thought, so I hope hopefully that program is delivering uh, delivering lots of benefits with uh, with effective uh, uh, program risk management um so yeah that there's and, and quite a few comments around the um the sort of pluses and minuses of um of the sort of independent risk management processes versus versus uh versus workshops as well and, and obviously there are you know there are some pros and cons with with each of those and i think i think what you've been saying ruth and penny is it's it's more a blend of using you know using the uh those blend of techniques to get a, a sort of a rounded view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tamsin had made a, had given us a comment earlier about the lack of senior attention to high risk. So there might have been good diligent work done, um, you know, to to record those and escalate them, but then they're not taken seriously. And um, you know, I do have lots of lots of sympathy with that one. And I think this is where you know, as program leaders, it, it's about us. This is a this is a framing a framing challenge that you you frame the conversation to to get that attention to really speak to what does matter and this is where i would say then so don't go with your risk register like you know that your analysis might be in you know in um you know a standard heat map or you know a, a standard risk slide that goes into a governance pack but like ditch them and like use the data in a different way. Um, you know, that, um, that can work really well just by being, um, it's not that you're not using the information, but you're, you're presenting it and framing it in a different way to get a different response. That might work. Mm. Yeah, really good, um, good question from uh, Brad, uh, Brad Myers around um, the benefit of um, bringing in independent people to, to help with risk management. Yeah. Uh, any views on that? Any view on that? So how how important that is? Oh, absolutely. So we want everybody to uh, to work independently to uh, to think on their own and then to bring that together. Um, <coughs> Brad is hinting that it might be a little bit complicated to if you have people who are very independent and who who are less comfortable or less. Um, willing to work collaboratively. I think this is where having somebody who can facilitate um, and design how people will work collaboratively and to be a catalyst for collaboration is really helpful. I noticed um, Steve was asking about tools. So for example, you can, if you're going to have a workshop where you bring these people together to collaborate, you can design a, a series of steps that people can work in and you can bring various tools in and it doesn't have to be anything very high tech it might just be things like post-it notes or having a, um, a way of getting independent input in in a workshop anonymous input that people can't see where it's come from for example Ruth you look like you're you'd like to jump in yeah. with something well, only that I want. I just wanted to make sure that Brad hadn't mis misunderstood that when I said independent input, I didn't mean from outside of the company or outside of the organisation. I just meant input from, you know, the team or stakeholders, who, whoever, working independently from each other. So yeah, so you know, so your independent input might be people from you know uh, suppliers or you know who are out with your organisation. But when I said independent input, I just meant people, individuals, 
working separately before they come together. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Right. Clear, in, case I had, in case I've made it confusing in the first place. Great. Thanks I love the comment from me. Tamsin. I've just noticed the comment from Tamsin that all virtual is perhaps more slightly level than all in person because everybody has a front row seat. So that can be quite helpful too sometimes. Great stuff. Now, thank you for that comment. Right. Um, so I think um, we've got about a minute or so to go. So just uh, just some closing comments. So. Uh, obviously, I'd like to, to thank both Ruth and Penny uh, for a you know, really thought-provoking uh, session, um, and, and for everybody that is attending, uh, for, you know, for those that have given their input. Um, I think you know, at one point we're just getting totally unindated with comments and suggestions and questions, so it's really brilliant. Um, so, I, you know, thank you to all those, especially that have contributed to the system, to, to the to the session. So, once again, thank you, everyone. Uh, and have uh, a great afternoon all. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Okay.